<laughs> so I, it's a pleasure to be here. I was just on a plane from Paris last night and reflecting that these are really both the, uh, France and India are two places with great traditions in probability. So it's, it was uh, nice to travel from one to the other. Uh, while most of the focus of these lectures will be on mixing of finite Markov chains, I decided today to start with one general estimate that applies both to finite and infinite. It, uh, it's a <coughs> and then we will go back and discuss more kind of the motivation and where we will head in the next of the in the rest of the course. Of course, you've seen on the website an ambitious plan. I don't promise to cover in detail all the topics there, but you'll have the, uh, but I did give reference, so I will touch upon these topics and describe them uh, to some extent, and then I included the references for those who want to see more. So without further ado, let me start with uh, introducing what in my mind is one of the high points of M Markov chains or of probability. Let me switch uh, these pens. And this is the varopoulos karn a long range estimate. So the setting will be a uh, finite or countable a, a finite or a countable Markov chain. It will be reversible. So we're going to have a some stationary measure pi so that that will satisfy this relation. So P is the, as usual, the transition kernel. So given, so PXY is a stochastic matrix, right? The sum for each X, when we sum over Y, PXY we get one. And this is the equation of reversibility. So this, um, <coughs> This means reversibility with reversing measure or stationary measure pi. Now, intuitively what reversibility means is that if you observe the Markov chain uh, and then uh, think of it as a movie where you see the Markov chain moving, then you take this movie and you run it backward. If you started at stationarity, so x0 is chosen according to pi, then uh, you cannot tell when looking at this movie if, it's, if you're seeing it forward or backward. So maybe before uh, going in, let's um, just recall. So the standard, so one, one basic class of examples are uh, simple random walks on graphs. So we start with G a finite or infinite graph. It's all the degrees will be finite. So every vertex has finitely many neighbors. And the transition probability PXY is just one over the degree of X if Y is a neighbor of X. So I write y tilde x just to mean that y is a neighbor of x in the graph, and, uh, and 0 otherwise. Right? So that's simple random walk. And simple random walk is always reversible where pi of x is the degree of x. So notice this is a measure on the vertices of the graph or the states of the Markov chain. As you can see, it's not normalized. So this uh, pi, when we sum it over all nodes, we will get um, 
something large in a finite graph and an infinite value in an infinite graph. <laughs> if we're working with a finite graph, it's often convenient and we often will normalize pi. Of course, when you normalize, that doesn't change uh, this equation. So with this setting, we can... Okay, so that's the example of a reversible chain. Now, in, more generally, instead of simple random walk on the graph, you can start with a... So if you have a graph, you could have weights on the edges of the graph. And these are often called conductances. So for every edge, you have a weight. Eh? And, and then instead of simple random walk, where all, edge, all edges have the same weight, you give each weight, each edge, the weight, which is this conductance. So given at the vertex, you choose which edge to walk on um, proportional to these weights. So the probability to take an edge E is the conductance on E divided by the total conductance from the node. So those who haven't seen this may want to verify that this is already full generality. That is, if you have any irreducible, uh, reversible Markov chain, then you can represent it by a random walk on a weighted graph. So these are just two views of the same object. To go in one direction, if you have a weighted graph, pi of a vertex will be just the sum of the conductances on the edges from that vertex. Right? So pi of x you take to be the sum over all edges E of the form x something and uh, CE. So just the total conductance on edges coming out of, of x. So, and that will be the stationary measure with respect to this weighted walk. Remember, the probability of choosing in, uh, uh, going along an edge E will just be CE divided by pi x if we start at x. So this is random walk on a weighted graph. It's an example of a reversible Markov chain, but in fact, it's the general example. And uh, irreducibility of the reversible chain corresponds to connectedness of this graph. What's an example of a non-reversible chain? Well, this uh, you can easily draw many, but uh, the most important for us will just be a biased walk on the cycle. So, for instance, suppose you walk with probability two thirds to the right, say uh, two thirds clockwise and one third anticlockwise on a cycle. This is a very nice irreducible. Markov chain, but, and the same rule from every vertex, probability two-thirds to the right, one-third to the left, or two-thirds clockwise, one-third anti-clockwise, and this uh, chain is not reversible. So you can't put, uh, so you can't put pi there that will satisfy the reversibility equation. And indeed, if you look if there was such a pi, it would have to double each time you go in this direction, and of course that can't work when you close the cycle. So, <laughs> a note there's a big contrast. If I compare this to this chain, suppose I have a path, and every vertex I walk probability two thirds to the right, one third to the left, and let's make you know this node absorbing. Well, this. Maybe let's, we won't make it absorbing. We'll make it from this node you go just to the left. From this node you go just to the right. So suppose this is, I make a small modification of the cycle by just really removing one edge from the cycle or breaking one edge. Then I get a path. And at every vertex, I walk probability two thirds to the right, one third to the left. But at the end points, I can't do that. So at the end point, say, you automatically go to the neighboring node. This is still an irreducible Markov chain, and this one is reversible. So these two chains behave completely differently. They only differ by one edge, but uh, completely different here. The walk is the stationary. There is a stationary measure here. So stationary measure, recall, is just the relation pi p equals pi, if I think of pi as a row vector and p as a matrix, this is the 
stationarity. So in this case, the stationary measure is just uniform. It's a unique stationary measure, and it's uniform measure. Unique up to scaling, of course, always. If you want a probability measure, then it's really unique. But um, in this case, <coughs> the, there's a di the stationary measure is completely different. Here it's uniform, and it's not a uniform stationary measure, and it's not reversible. Here, pi will grow exponentially. Each time you go from one, a, you know, one node to the right, the endpoints are a little bit different, but in, inside, the mass keeps doubling. And so, almost all the mass of the stationary measure will be concentrated on the right-hand side. <laughs> so, it's a, so one thing you might want to think about is if you haven't, so this one is not reversible and it's clear if, uh, if you look at the movie, if you look at this chain, well, it typically is moving to the right. So, uh, so of course, if you reverse the movie, it will look differently. But it's a little bit surprising the first time you see this, that this, I said this chain is reversible because you can easily write pi that will satisfy the reversibility equation. But here it also seems like the chain is typically going to the right. So what is, but I told you that reversible chain means that if I look at the chain, I can't tell if I'm looking at going forward or backward. Who can tell me what is, so it's, it looks like a contradiction. I'm telling you that this chain is reversible, but if I look at it, it seems like it should be moving typically to the right. What's the solution of this paradox? We're starting at stationarity, thank you. And because the stationary measure is so concentrated near here, uh, when I run at stationarity, I'm basically always running near here, constantly banging into this uh, right endpoint. And so you really cannot tell that's true, both for the chain and its reversal. But this, there's still something a little non-intuitive here, so you may want to consider it a bit. Okay, so with that, background, what is the um, estimate that's in the title there? So, so the theorem, the veropoulos cohen theorem, is, 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 says that for a reversible, so in the setting, in the setting I mentioned, the transition probability Pt of xy, so this is a transition probability in t steps, or equivalently, this is just a uh, entry in the matrix p to the t. But we think of it probabilistically, it's the probability to go in t steps from x to y. <coughs> okay, it's bounded by uh, twice there's a factor of pi y over pi x times the probability of st I'll explain what this means, bigger than dxy. And this, in turn, is bounded by 2 root pi y over pi x, e to the minus d squared of xy over 2t. Okay, so uh, where st is, uh, maybe I'll write p0, st is simple random walk on the integers. Right, so our most basic Markov chain is on the set of integers, which walks one step to the right, one step to the left, equally likely. That's st. So. Now I'm using t to index time, although time for me will usually be discrete. Uh, so just be aware that t is you know, going through the integers. Why are we not using n? Because often we will have uh, finite graphs with uh, uh, n nodes, or anyway, n will be a parameter relating to the <coughs> size of the finite graph. So I want to use something different from time, so it will be t. Good. So dxy is, 
is the distance from x to y in the graph determined by by p. So I told you before how to build a Markov chain from a graph, but we of course can do it the other way. Given a Markov chain, we define a graph where two nodes are adjacent if we can move from one to the other with positive probability. And because we are talking about reversible chains, this is an undirected graph. Right? So if I can move from x to y, I can also move from y to x. Of course, you can build such graphs for a general Markov chains, then they will be directed graphs. Okay, so this is an undirected graph, and we're just measuring distance in this graph. In other words, the dxy is the minimal number of steps that the chain needs to go from x to y, or equivalently from y to x. Okay, so it's a distance. The weight is one. What? The weight on the edges you take it to be. No, no. So this is a, a general. So the weight is not playing a role in this formulation, but really I have a general Markov chain P. So if I want to think of it as a, a, inter as a weighted graph, then I would use the conductance I would use on an edge xy would be, for instance, pi of x times P of xy. If you want to think of it as a weighted graph, well, this solves the exercise I uh, asked before to show that any reversible Markov chain is obtained uh, from some weighted graph. So these are the weights that will give this uh, <laughs> that will correspond to the Markov chain. But notice that in the formulation of the theorem the weights don't appear, we just have p and pi and the graph. But the weights on the edges, well they are implicit but they, they're not explicit there. Any questions about the statement, what it means? So. Yes? I can't hear. Yes, that's why I said setting, which is reversible Markov chain, yes. Definitely. Okay, any, any other question? So, <laughs> um, right, just, to get our bearings, so I mentioned a you know, reversible Markov chain. Let's look at this non-reversible example. We have n vertices. Suppose I take <laughs> suppose I take t, which equals just let's test this theorem uh, in this example, which is not reversible. So suppose I take x here and I take a y here and I, let's take the distance from x to y to be say n over 3 <coughs> so and, and take time which is n okay so notice that this Markov chain is just the projection to the cycle of a biased walk on the integers. A biased walk on the integers walks, right, which walks with probability two-thirds to the right, one-thirds to the left, has a drift of one-thirds to the right. So just from uh, the, <coughs> uh, you know, the law of large numbers tells you that at time t equals n, the walk is expected location is going to be uh, about n over three. And the, the central limit theorem, or more precisely the local central limit theorem, tells you that the probability to move from, uh, from x to y in this example where the, their distance is n over 3, the probability is approximately what? So you should be able to tell me up to constant. I, don't, I mean, the, cons the constants involve some pi, and I don't care about them now. But what is the probability if x and y are distance n over 3? and I move and I take time which is n, and this is say an n cycle, what is the chance to go from x to y? What is the order of magnitude of this probability? <laughs> huh? 
Okay. Yes? So, the Veropoulos Karn bound would give an exponentially small probability, but no, it doesn't apply because this chain is not reversible. So I'm asking, uh, this, is, this example is really contrasting with the theorem. It's not an example of the theorem, it's an example where the theorem doesn't apply. It's an example where the probability here is much larger. So the mean of the walk after n steps is, is n over 3. The, um, so, and the, so if I was doing it on z, the mean would be n over 3. The variance would also be order n. Again, I don't care now about the constants. So it means the standard deviation is root n. And a walk after n steps would be distributed around n over 3 with a standard deviation of root order root n. So the probability it will land exactly at n over 3 um, is going to be constant over root n. And this is much more, if you try to plug in these, uh, these numbers, you'll get, uh, as, uh, as was commented here, you'll get something exponentially small. So you see the Ropoulos Kahn bound gives you something uh, which, you know, it's, it actually turns out to be a remarkably strong bound. And this example is just to illustrate that it doesn't apply without reversibility. So we're really using reversibility. So, okay, so uh, let's see, where is the, is this the eraser? Yeah. So, so the, the content, <laughs> the real content of the bound is the first step. The last step is the, just the classical uh, large deviation bound for the binomial that goes under many names. Maybe Bernstein was the first to prove it, but you can find it under uh, Chernoff, uh, also under the name Chernoff bound. So let's just warm them up with this statement. This is uh, something you know, uh, which is about close to 100 years old now. Uh, the bound on just a simple random walk on Z. So <laughs> right, so I have. Right, so when t and r are positive numbers, the probability that st is bigger than r is bounded by, uh, has a kind of Gaussian tail. So, <laughs> so this is a special case of much more general estimates, but uh, let's just do this one. So let's take x, which is the basic increment of the simple random walk, so it's plus minus 1 with equal probability. So expectation e to the lambda x, so the moment generating function is just e to the lambda plus e to the minus lambda over 2, so it's just a hyperbolic cosine, but uh, let's write the, the Taylor series of this, so it's just uh, some we only have the even powers here, right? Because the odd powers cancel. And we get lambda to the 2k over 2k factorial. So just the even part of the series for the exponential, k from 0 to infinity. And <laughs> observe that this is less than the sum over the same range of lambda to the 2k over 2 to the k k factorial. So, 
So if you look at 2k factorial, right, it's a product of all the numbers until 2k, but if you just take the even numbers until 2k, you'll get, so this is a product of t independent factors, so this will just be uh, e to the t lambda squared over 2, because it's going to be the tth power of this expectation. Okay, so now we're going to use that with the Markov's inequality to bound Less or equal, thank you. So we're going to use that to bound the probability of st bigger than r, which is of course the same. T and r are positive, uh, uh, you know, t and r are both positive numbers here. So this is the same as the probability of e to the <laughs> e to the lambda st. being bigger than e to the lambda r. And now Markov's inequality allows us to bound this by e to the minus lambda r times the expectation of this quantity and the expectation we already bounded by e to the t lambda squared over 2. Okay, so this is just Markov's inequality. And so this bound is true. And note, this doesn't involve lambda. Here there is lambda. So we can choose whichever lambda we want. And of course, we optimize, so to optimize this, this is just the exponential of some quadratic function of lambda. So, so to optimize this, you just choose the lambda that, uh, well, minimizes what's, uh, what's in the power here. So what lambda is that? Sorry? R by t. So <laughs> if you cho choose lambda, which is, which is R over t, then um, you'll get exactly this bound. Okay, so that's the Chernoff bound or uh, Bernstein bound. And again, there are many uh, fancier inequalities, but often the starting point is a similar calculation, which is then, you know, done in a more refined way. <laughs> okay, so that's the, so Observe that, of course, this is re reminiscent of the central limit theorem. The difference is that uh, there are no, uh, you know, root to pi here, no integrals, and it's not an asymptotic statement. It's a, it's a bound. It's this bound is is quite good as long as um, r is not too large. But observe, you know, if you take r equals two t, the probability is zero there on the left and the right hand side is some positive quantity. So this bound, you know, is not always optimal, but in many ranges, it's, uh, it's quite useful. All right, so that's, so that, that's the easy part here. And, uh, you know, so uh, Veropoulos and Karin were not doing this, they were doing this. In fact, Veropoulos proved a weaker inequality by a kind of amazing method. So what did Veropoulos do? He had this graph where you, to prove, you wanted to prove this inequality. And uh, <coughs> he didn't know how to do this directly in the graph, but he was a, an expert on Brownian motion and manifolds. And he realized that he could take the graph, replace every edge by a little pipe, and create a manifold which behaves a lot like the graph. So think of replacing every edge by a pipe, you get some uh, surface which is con constructed of all these pipes. And it was already known, this uh, goes back to work of um, Furstenberg and Kanai and others, that Brownian motion on this manifold is a very good approximation to random walk on the original graph. And he was able to use this connection together with some tricks from a PDE or Brian motion on manifolds to get a bound of this nature, although he had some additional factors, so it wasn't quite as elegant as the one I write here. Um, so this was in 85, 1985. And shortly thereafter, Keith Karn in England um, found what is the right discrete analog of the Veropoulos proof. And this is this proof is one of the really gems of, of probability or use of basic analysis in probability. So I want to show it to you now. So the, 
I said the basic idea of this general idea is due to Veropoulos. The exact theorem, as I stated there, is due to Karn. And I gave some references in the notes. So let's prove it. But we're going to simplify our life a little. We're going to prove it in the case where pi is uniform. So this is the case where P is just a symmetric matrix. Um, and it's a good exercise to generalize the proof I show you here to the case of a general pi. And if you get lazy with this exercise, you can find it in Karn's original paper or in um, the two other sources I gave in the notes. So in my uh, book, there's an exposition in my book with Russ Lyons. And there's an exposition in the notes with Julie Komyathy from a similar school I gave in St. Petersburg a few years ago. But on the board, I'm just going to make, you know, choose the lazy route myself and just uh, do it with pi uniform. That is really only a notational saving, but uh, we'll do that. So, so let's go, we're going to prove it in that case. So then we don't have this, uh, this uh, little factor with this square root and this statement. Uh, and it still applies to lots of cases. So um, random walks on regular graphs. So if you have a graph where all degrees are the same, then pi is uniform. And actually, veropoulos karn theorem has had some of its most spectacular uses for random walks on groups, which are regular. So this is already an important case. It's not just a trivial special case. OK, so let's prove it in, a, in that case. So, the proof won't be long, but it will you know, look a bit like a miracle, so uh, hold on. Uh, it uses the Chebyshev polynomials, but luckily it doesn't requ require any knowledge of fine properties of the Chebyshev polynomials, just their definition. So let's... Um, so... Where, is, where did it put Okay, so. I'm going to call them QK. Usually they're called TK, but I'm going to call them QK. And QK of cosine theta is cosine of K theta. Now let's, again, I'm not going to assume you know anything about these polynomials, so I'm going to, because what we need about them are very easy things we will derive right here. So first, in particular, we will see why these are polynomials. So, um, so let's do the easy cases. So Q, Q0, so if K equals 0, Q0 is just identically 1, and Q1 Well, Q1 of cosine theta is so Q1 of, of a variable, maybe we'll call the variable Z. Q1 of Z is just Z. Okay. Who's close enough to high school to remember what is Q2? Yeah, 2 squared minus 1. Thank you. 2z squared minus 1. Now, now, in general, there is a recursion for the Chebyshev polynomials, and it's obtained from the trigonometric identity if you add cosine k theta and cosine, I'm sorry, cosine k plus 1 theta and cosine k minus 1 theta, <coughs> you'll get uh, twice cosine theta times cosine k theta. <coughs> so if we uh, use this uh, Right, so here I mean this is the cosine of k plus 1 theta. I'm not putting in all the parentheses I really need to. And this is the cosine of k minus 1 theta. So in terms of, so this is just, um, so if we think of, 
So again, we denote z as cosine theta for the moment. Then this is saying that qk plus 1 of z plus qk minus 1 of z equals 2z qk of z. Okay, and this proves by induction that the qk indeed are polynomials. So qk is a polynomial with degree of degree k. You just get that by induction, so we saw it for 0, 1, and even 2, and then for larger, larger k, if you know it already up to k, so you know that this qk is a degree k polynomial, then here you're getting something of degree k plus 1, you have to subtract something of degree k minus 1, so you'll get something indeed of degree k plus 1 for qk plus 1. So this is the, these are the Chebyshev polynomials. <laughs> so what do we need about them? We need that they're, we'll use a couple of things that will be easy to derive. So, but one key thing I want to point out now is that if z is a real number between minus 1 and 1, then qk of z is also a real number between minus 1 and 1. So note qk, I defined it this way, but of course now that there are polynomials, I could plug in any z I like. I will only, despite the notation z, I will only plug in um, actually real z for this, but um, later it will be, a, I will replace z by a matrix. But, I mean, given a polynomial, you can plug in you know, anything that uh, you can take powers of, you can plug into a polynomial. But, but if z is between minus 1 and 1, then z can be represented as cosine theta. And then because of the original definition, we know that qk of z is also between minus 1 and 1. If you write these out as polynomials, well, for q2 it's still obvious, but if I write q15 and I look at this polynomial, it's not clear from the expression that it's bounded between minus 1 and 1 in the interval minus 1, 1. But it is clear from the original definition. Okay? So that's one thing we'll use. By the way, if something I'm saying, if I'm going too, uh, too slow or too fast, please let me know and I will try to adjust. So, uh, Just one more, ah, okay. So this is what we still need to, to prove, so I'll try to keep that on the board. Um, okay, so the other thing we need is a consequence of the binomial expansion. What happens if you take cosine theta to, to the tth power. So I want to write this in this form, take this to the tth power, and now we can write the binomial expression, and I claim what we get when we write it out, I can write the in the following way, the probability that st equals k e to the um, so k here ranges from uh, from minus t until t so of course if you write the binomial formula by definition it will look a little bit different but then you can rewrite it in this form <laughs> Another way to think of it is that if you just really literally think of, you have all these factors, e to the i, they're all, plus e to the minus i theta you know, over 2, and I write, I write this power by writing t factors like that, and now I have to multiply this whole thing. 
Well, in order to multiply, I just have to select one of the one of the summons here, one of the summons here, and so on. So I just have to select these summons. And this selection is exactly the same as the selection that a random walk has to do, going left or right. And in the end, if I selected j times to go um, <laughs> j times to go left and uh, k minus j times to go right, I will end, I'm sorry, t minus j steps to go right, I will end at some location, end at some location k, which is uh, t minus 2j, and, <laughs> but, and you see that the coefficient of e to the ik theta here will, the, will be exactly the total probability that the random walk will be k. Anyway, this is just taking the binomial formula and you know, rewriting the indices, so I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, but let's see what that means in terms of the Chebyshev polynomials. First, let's take real part of both sides. After all, the left side is real. So, and in the right side, so if I take real part, it, so the right side is real, although it's not as apparent. So if I take real part, it's not going to change, and it's going to be the sum over k of the probability st equals k, and the real part of e to the i k theta is the cosine of k theta. I'm sorry, I have cosine t to the t, thank you. Okay, so now if we use the same notation from the other board, z equals cosine t, we'll get the z to the t equals the sum over k from minus t to t. Probability that st equals k, remember st is the simple random walk, started at zero, times qk of z. This is an identity, now I should be more careful here, I want to write q absolute value k. So here I have a sum with both positive and negative values, but of course cosine k theta is the same if I uh, change k to minus k, so, and the polynomials are only defined for positive index, so I put q absolute value. Okay, so we have, um, so we have this identity. So this is an identity between polynomials, right? z to the t can be uh, written as a sum of Chebyshev polynomials, with uh, these uh, binomial coefficients in front. Questions? Okay, so if we have an identity between two, if two polynomials, I mean, we verify the identity when z is cosine theta, but you know, if any two polynomials are equal on the interval minus one, one, they're really equal. So these polynomials are the same polynomial, so I can plug in Instead of z, which is the variable in this here, I'm going to plug in the matrix P, the transition matrix P. After all, P, I can take powers of it, and I can add, uh, uh, you know, add powers. So, uh, so we get see it's dangerous to mix these. Erasers. So, so somehow someone couldn't decide if they wanted the whiteboard or a blackboard. And <laughs> it looks like the decision by committee. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, in, so let's plug in the matrix P. So P to the T is the sum probability. You see, I mean, we, we, ha we want to prove something about, P to, about the, an entry in P to the T. So right now I've been telling you about polynomials. It seems completely, you know, what am I doing? What does it have to do? Finally, well, there's at least going to be some P to the T in the game. So P to the T, so this is the matrix P, and here this kind of blackboard bold P, this is the probability for simple random walk. ST equals K times Q absolute value K of the matrix P. 
Okay, so this is the same identity, but when the variable has been replaced by a matrix. Okay, so this is an identity between, well, polynomials, but now it's polynomials and matrices, so now it's an identity between these two matrices, and we're going to look at <coughs> Uh, really what we want is to look at the specific entry on the left-hand side. So we want to understand what can we say about the entries of the right-hand side. So let's focus, so this is some combination here. So let's focus on these QK of P. What can we say about them? <laughs> so, so first thing is if the distance from X to Y is bigger than K, then let's look at QK of P. Okay, let me think of positive K. What, suppose that the distance from X to Y is actually strictly bigger than K. What can we say about this matrix entry? You take QK of P and look at the matrix entry at x, y. It has a very round value, yes. What is the value? It's zero. Why is it zero? Remember, qk is a polynomial of degree k. So it's a combination of powers p, p squared, p cubed, up to p to the k. But if you look at a power like that, for instance, p to the k, x, y, it is zero because the distance of x, y is the minimal number of steps you need to go from x to y. So, you, so by definition, if k is less than the distance, p to the k x y is zero. You cannot go from x to y in k steps. They're just too far. Okay? So all of these entries when the distance is bigger than k are zero. Now we also have to say something about about other entries. So if we don't have that condition, what can we say in this case about <coughs> QK of P of, of XY? And I want to write it in kind of a vector notation. This is the, if I take the unit vector at X, so delta X is a vector which is one at X and zero everywhere else. And I can actually write this as a, as a scalar product of delta x times qk of p applied to delta y. So this is, <laughs> um, this is the point where when we have a general reversible chain, we have to worry about, we have to take the scalar product in L2 of pi, but here we're just taking a standard, standard scalar product. So, so I claim that the, we can bound this rather effectively. So to bound it, um, if I have a matrix and I take, uh, you know, apply a matrix to a vector, I can bound this by the norm of the matrix. And because my matrices here are symmetric, P, remember we're do, doing the case where P is a symmetric matrix. So all the powers of P are also symmetric. And any polynomial in P is also a symmetric matrix. So QK of P is a symmetric matrix. So for a symmetric matrix, what do you know about its L2 norm? How much its operator norm? Uh, it's, it's given by, by the largest eigenvalue. Thank you. So really to understand how big this quantity could be, we have to understand how big is the largest eigenvalue of QK of P? How big can it be? Now, what are the eigenvalues of QK of P? Well, we don't know, but we can say in terms of the eigenvalues of P. So if lambda is an eigenvalue of P, what are the eigenvalues corresponding QK of, QK of lambda, right? You diagonalize P, and then, you know, when you're taking uh, powers, the diagonal form evolves. So so again, this is, 
we're calling some linear algebra, we know that Right, so the eigenvalues of QK of P are all have the form QK of lambda, where lambda is an eigenvalue of P. Now P is a symmetric matrix, so all its eigenvalues are real, but its P is also a transition matrix for a Markov chain. So all its eigenvalues are between minus one and one. The largest one eigenvalue is one. So um, so all these lambdas are between minus one and one. By the way, maybe uh, when we finish the proof, we'll ask one of you to recall the proof why all why all the eigenvalues of a Markov chain are in absolute value at most one. But anyway, that's an easy fact. We're, we have to, yeah, we're after the break. We're almost there. OK, so lambda is between minus 1 and 1. So QK of lambda is also between minus 1 and 1. So this is what I discussed before, that the Chebyshev polynomials map minus 1, 1 to minus 1, 1 because of the definition. Cosine k theta is also in minus 1, 1. So this means that P, its operator norm is at most 1. So, so this QK of P delta Y has L2 norm at most 1. And so this whole thing is at most 1. In absolute value. Okay, so so now let's go to the identity we have here and plug into that identity a particular <coughs> entry. So we're looking at p to the t at the entry x, y, and we have sum over k. Now, the k, as we discussed, we only need to k take k, which is an absolute value bigger than the distance from x to y. The smaller k give us a contribution of 0. And for this k, again, let's, now I'm going to write an inequality. I don't need an absolute value because this thing is, is positive, but it's not going to kill me. And uh, so I have a sum over k's so that the absolute value of k is bigger than dxy. And then for those, I'm just going to, I have to take qkp and look at the xy entry. And we said that's at most 1 using this kind of spectral argument. So we have the probability of st equals k. All right? And in the case when pi is uniform, this is exactly what's written here. Right? It's the probability that uh, st is bigger than dxy. And there's a factor 2 here because uh, we have this absolute value. OK? This is exactly what, uh, what was claimed. So um, as, as Manju indicated, this is a good time for a break. So we'll stop. <laughs>